Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to this uh, little sprinkly day today in Spokane. Um, my name is Frank Chalet from the Parkinson's Resource Center, and I'd just like to uh, thank all of you for making the trip here in Spokane and all of our friends out at our remote sites for joining us today for an excellent uh, discussion. Um, I'd also like to uh, introduce and, well, first of all, thank our sponsors and introduce a couple special guests. Uh, first of all, one of our sponsors, Northwest Parkinson's, our partners out of Seattle. Uh, we've got Ruth Ager and Colleen Crowley joining us today, and Colleen will say a few words at the end of the program, so thank you for being here. We appreciate your support. I'd also like to thank Albertsons, as always, for their financial support uh, for this uh, program, as well as others that we perform throughout the year, and our host, St. Luke's Rehab Center and Northwest Telehealth, uh, Mark Harger, who is uh, joining us today, uh, who is producing today's program. So thank you to all of you, and, and certainly, um, last but not least, our volunteers who make this happen every month. So thank you for everything that you do. Uh, as always, everybody uh, that have been with us for a while knows the protocol, but just in case there's some new people in the audience out there, we'll hold the questions until the end of the program. Uh, at that time, I'll go ahead and uh, do roll call across each of our sites uh, to do Q&A. Uh, also, I would ask you up front to please mute your microphones uh, until we uh, get to the Q&A portion at the end, and I'll announce that at that time. Um, as always, at least the last few months, we've tried to take attendance at each site, so please be prepared uh, when we call on you for your questions uh, to provide the numbers of folks who are in attendance today. So with that, let's get to our program. Our featured speaker today is Heaven Mayer. Uh, Heaven Meyer, excuse me. Sorry, Heaven. <laughs> Looks like Mayer. Uh, Heaven is a practicing optometrist. She has a private practice on the South Hill of Spokane. And today she's going to talk about Parkinson's and your vision. So how about a warm welcome for Heaven Mayer? Hi, thanks so much for inviting me to speak today. You know, in terms of the Meyer or Mayor, I have to say that I, I dated my husband for about six months, be, and I was referring to him to my roommate, and she and I said Mayor, and she goes, "Oh, you mean Mitch Meyer?" And so, so I definitely understand <laughs> the mispronunciation of that name. <laughs> um, <clears throat> okay, so a little bit background on me: I did my undergraduate work at Duke University in North Carolina. But it had nothing to do with vision or with Parkinson's. I was an environmental science and policy major. And while I was doing um, lab work, basically, and global change work, I realized what I really needed to be fulfilled in a career was to hear people's stories and to work face to face with people. And so that's what led me into the career of optometry. And um, so I then did my doctorate of optometry at uh, Pacific University College of Optometry in Forest Grove, Oregon. And then after graduating about seven years ago, I started my practice cold up on the South Hill. And, and the name of the practice is Eyes for Life. So, so I just want to clarify the confusion people often have about who are the three O's, the three different eye care providers. Um, as I mentioned, I'm an optometric physician, also known as an optometrist. And we are, have our four years of graduate school related to vision and the function of vision as well as eye disease. Ophthalmologists or the IMDs and surgeons do surgery and they, uh, the overlap is that they do eye disease as well. And then the opticians are the ones who, who fill the glasses prescriptions. And some of them have done an apprenticeship and, and um, have tested to have special licensure. So I'm not planning on talking a whole lot about what is Parkinson's disease because I'm sure that you all have had a lot of lectures on that and probably know about it even more better than I do. Um, but just to ground us all in, in the basics of it, Parkinson's is a progressive degenerative neurological disease caused by a lack of dopamine in the central nervous system. So this dopamine is a neurotransmitter. What that means is that for these neurons to talk to each other and the communication to happen, um, we need dopamine present. And the lack of dopamine causes a variety of movement problems. And what you may not be as aware of is that it causes a variety of vision problems. So that's what we're going to discuss today. So as a progressive degenerative disease, there, there is some bad news in that there are a lot of symptoms that occur to your vision that, as an eye doctor, I'm not able to do anything about. But before writing it off, um, there are, 
there are diseases that we need to separate out and determine whether your visual deficits are related to Parkinson's or whether there's other optical errors or diseases that need to be addressed and can be addressed. Um, and additionally, it's really important that we maximize the vision of a Parkinson's patient as long as possible. And the reason for that, oh, besides just the fact that we all want to have great vision as long as possible, is that there are two systems in the body that help orient us spatially in terms of keeping our upright posture and helping us with locomotion or movement and our balance. And that would be the visual system and the proprioceptive system. The proprioceptive system is our unconscious awareness of where we are in space. So when I, even if my eyes are closed and I put out my arm, I know exactly where my arm is relative to the other things around me. Well, that system starts to break down in Parkinson's, and that's where we need to fill in those gaps with vision. And as you are aware, Parkinson's patients have a trouble initiating movement, and that's where vision can act and give a conscious override to help get that act accomplished. Um, but the problem, the rub, is that vision too is affected. So here are my objectives for the talk today. I, I first would like to orient you to the basic eye anatomy so that you might better understand an eye exam better and understand more about what we're going to talk about in the talk. Um, we're then going to discuss common eye diseases that must also be managed. We're going to identify the common visual complaints that come with Parkinson's disease and then discuss vision correction options. So here's the eyeball, and we're going to move from front to back. Um, there's the tear film, the cornea, the conjunctiva and sclera, the iris lens, vitreous retina, optic nerve, and visual pathway. And I'm going to briefly touch on each of those. So you may not even think of the tear film as being an anatomical structure, but indeed is incredibly important to good vision as well as eye comfort. And it is compromised by age, medication, and reduced blink rate, three things that definitely affect the Parkinson's patient. So what you see here in this photo is a picture of the front of the eye that has had sodium flor flor um, fluoresce, uh, uh, a strip of dye put to the eye, and it colors the tears. Now, when this is freshly applied and one blinks, it should just be a smooth layer of yellow. But you see down here that there are these black spots emerging. So what, what's happening is we're seeing evaporation and the dry spots that form on the cornea after enough time has gone by when there has not been a blink. Well, why this is important, and I'm showing you this photo, is that the normal blink rate for, for most people is about 12 times a minute. But for Parkinson's patient, it can be so decreased that it's less than one time per minute. And so normally, when I put this stain on someone, we do what's called tear breakup time assessment, where I have a person intentionally leave their, hold their eyes open, and then I see how long does it take until those dry spots form. Now, typically, after about 10 seconds, one is going to blink, and that tear film should hold the entire time. But if someone is not blinking, the effect is that they're going to have dryness, and then their eyes start burning. And then they have reflex tearing and the eyes just start pouring, but yet that blink in a Parkinson's patient still does not happen. And so as a result, it looks like the person is tearing and crying, but what's really happening is that it's a dry eye from a lack of blinking and other factors that impair the tear film. Behind the tear film and protected by the tear film is the cornea, the clear front surface of the eye. And um, this structure has more nerve endings than it, just about any other place in the body. And so when you have this dry, eye, you're, you're really going to feel it. You're going to feel it with burning. That is initially. But dry eye is a chronic disease, and over time, the cornea starts losing its sensitivity. And of course, if you have dry patches and those surface cells of the cornea, the epithelial cells are, are starting to be killed off, it's like having a, a bruise, or not bruise, a, a scratch on your skin. You're more likely to get an infection. So one's eye health can be compromised and you're not really aware of it because you've started to lose sensitivity from this being a chronic problem. <clears throat> and then there's the sclera, which is the white of the eye, and the conjunctiva. The conjunctiva is the clear skin that covers the white of the eye. You've probably all heard the term conjunctivitis or another name for pink eye. I, I'm not a fan of the term pink eye because it really tells us very little. There are so many different reasons why one may have a pink eye. Everything from the dry eye, which we've talked a little bit about, to 
um, an autoimmune disorder, a viral infection, a bacterial infection. And so it's really important to come in and have an eye exam if you're having a red, irritated eye, so we can get to the bottom of why is your eye red and, and what's the proper treatment for it. So behind the cornea is then uh, and the iris or the colored part of the eye, which is a set of muscles that form the pupil, and that's the main function to um, regulate this aperture like on a camera for different lighting conditions. And we do use drops in an eye exam to open up the pupil, which is like opening up the window of the eye so we can take a better look at the back of the eye. Behind that sits the lens of the eye. And the lens, I'm gonna use this laser pointer that I was <laughs> lens. So right here we have what are called zonules or kind of like little thread structures that attach this muscle, ciliary muscle to the lens. And the point of those is that when we're looking at something up close, that lens needs to change shape to give us more power for focusing up close. Now, everyone who's about 43 years of age and older knows that that lens stops doing its job as effectively over time. And the other thing that happens to this lens are cataracts, which we'll discuss more in a little bit. Behind the lens sits the vitreous humor, which is a gelatinous mass that fills the space. And that's pretty much its job, is just to be a, a space filler. One thing to note about the vitreous is probably most of you have experienced what are called floaters, little black spots that seem like bugs moving around in your vision. And those are located here on the vitreous. So if you've ever tried to put the eye drops in and wash them away and, and realize they're not going anywhere, that's because that's internal to the eye. Most of the time, vitreous floaters are harmless. However, if you have new floaters or if you have flashes of light, you do need to be seen right away because that can be the precursor to a retinal detachment. Which brings us to the retina. The retina is the back of the eye. You can think of it like the wallpaper on the inside of the eye or the film of the camera. It's a half a millimeter thick and it is actually an extension of the brain. So it's part of the central ner nervous system. So this is a very important point right here. There are dopamine receptors in the, the retina. And these dopamine receptors are affected by Parkinson's disease, just like the substantia nigra of the brain that cause most of your movement problems. Visual processing begins at the retinal level. And so we're going to talk a lot uh, about more of the, the problems that come as a result of these retinal, cha retinal changes, and changes that you can't even see. I can't see as an eye doctor when I look in. But to give you an idea of what I do see when I look in, this is a picture taken with what's called an Optimap. It's this really cool instrument that I have that gives this wide 200 degree image of the back of the eye without even having to dilate. So just to orient you to a few uh, structures here, right here, this white circle disc is the optic nerve. And with it come in all these blood vessels that we get a beautiful view of. Over here is the macula. The macula is the sweet spot of vision. So your straight ahead vision is right there. So the optic nerve I pointed to, it's a bundle of 1.2 million nerve fibers that carry all the visual information from the eye to the brain. Okay, so before I get on to symptoms that are specific to Parkinson's disease and the eye, I want to talk about comorbidities. Because Parkinson's disease is a disease of the elderly, there are a number of eye diseases that are quite likely to be happening as well, and we need to sort those out and take care of the ones that we can. So we already talked about dry eye and the fact that dry eye could actually manifest as a, as a watery eye, so don't be fooled by that. What I like about dry eye is that I can do something about this. It's a manageable condition, and I have a bunch of tools at my disposal. Um, these tools include using artificial tears or rewetting drops. Of course, the problem with that is it's very hard for a Parkinson's patient to instill their own drops. But the next slide, I'll, I'll show you a solution we have for that. Um, punctal occlusion. Punctal occlusion is referring to putting these plugs right where the tears flow down to the nose. And the purpose of that is to keep the tears on the eye longer, whether it's your artificial tears or your own tears. When you're not blinking as much and those tears are going to evaporate very quickly, if you can keep more of them on there, it's going to help. Um, Restasis, you've probably seen ads for. It's a prescription medication that helps with tear production. And then flax or fish oil supplements help with um, the components having the right balance to the tears. And then you can just make your environment moister by using a humidifier. So I was oriented to this just two weeks ago when one of my cataract patients came in and, and showed me this. He had gotten it from a mail order catalog. And 
It's a coal instrument which will hold the eyelids open and then it has a hole to direct you where to look while you squeeze so that the drop will go in the right place. And when I looked this up online, I found it on a website for occupational therapists and, uh, and adaptive devices. So I just found out about these and I plan on ordering a bunch so that I can have them on hand for patients um, who have difficulty putting in their own drops. Along the same lines of dry eye, there's what's called blepharitis, which is an inflammation of the lids and lashes. And it's caused by the normal bacteria that's on the face getting out of control. And then that bacteria creates a toxin which is irritating to the front of the eye. So some of the hallmarks of this disease would be mucus on the lashes or an excess flaking in scales. Um, I, this is common in Parkinson's patients and in the elderly and anyone who's disabled partially because of the hygiene issues, the, the difficulty in washing one's own face effectively. But it's also just more common in certain skin types as well. And so the management for this are certain um, eye, eyelid cleaners that are specific for this disease and very effective. Um, it used to be very common that we use baby sh shampoo diluted to wash the lids, and it can still be done, but there are better products at this point. And then other therapies include using a prescription medication, doxycycline, or flaxseed oil, or fish oil. Okay, so I, I want to talk about cataracts, um, the lens of the eye that I talked about that does the focusing for us. Over time, as a result of UV light exposure from the sun, those proteins change and the lens becomes opaque. So maybe whitish or oftentimes brown. It's causing glare and it's going to make your vision go down. The good news is that cataract surgery is the most commonly performed surgery we have in the United States, and it goes very well. You know, in, in most, I would say in many places in the world that are developing countries, um, it is the leading cause of blindness, but we don't have to succumb to that. They can be removed. And I did a review of my Parkinson's charts prior to putting this together and found that half of my patients ended up needing cataract surgery. Half of my Parkinson's patients did need cataract surgery. There's age-related macular degeneration. So you may remember when I showed that picture and I said the macula is a sweet spot of vision. Well, with this disease, one starts to lose their central vision. It starts out being a little fuzzy, and then it can lead to an actual black hole in the center of vision. The good news is it never leads to complete blindness, but it definitely impairs one's vision quite significantly. Oh, here we go. Here's this macular area, and you can see the yellow deposits, which are called derusin, and they're waste deposits in the retina. And what I'm going to show you next is a cross-section and, and a very blown-up picture of the retina. And these are photoreceptors, the rods and cones, and this is the blood supply, the capillaries. And these nasty derusin, these uh, fatty deposits, are building up between the layers and pulling those photoreceptors away from their food supply, away from their blood supply. And so that's what causes the, de the degeneration. So there's a lot more to say on AMD, but I'm going to leave it at that. Then the, another common disease is glaucoma. So kind of the opposite from macular degeneration, where again, with that, you lost your central vision. Glaucoma causes a tunneling of vision and can lead to complete blindness. It's generally thought to be a result of high pressure in the eye, although that's not always the case, and we're always learning more about um, glaucoma. But when the pressure is elevated in the eye, damage occurs to the optic nerve, and these nerve fibers are, over time, gradually lost. So we manage the disease of glaucoma, generally with drops as the first line, drops that will lower the pressure. And I just want to show here, um, these are four different tools that are all used for checking pressure. So some of you may have experienced this one here, which is the old standard, the blue light. But one of the challenges of this instrument is that the patient has to get their head up against the forehead rest. And we know that there are postural issues that can come with Parkinson's disease, which make that very difficult. Also, that you have to keep your eye open nice and wide. Um, otherwise, it's pretty challenging to get the probe in there. Um, this one's the old favorite, the air puff. And uh, I used to have that. My patients are very glad that I got rid of it. Um, then, I, then I moved on to the tono pen, which with a little tap, I could get a reading. Um, but I've also abandoned that, and I, and I love this. This instrument here gives me a pressure reading without even having to put numbing drops in the eye. So I guess one of the things that this demonstrates is that technology is constantly advancing in my field, as in many fields. And so um, don't be surprised if when you visit your eye doctor, there's something new every year. 
And if you don't see something new every year, you may want to ask why, <laughs> because there is a lot that comes out. Okay, I think the final disease, comorbidity, I wanted to discuss was diabetic retinopathy, the leading cause of blindness for people younger than age 45. Um, so diabetes is on the rise because of our epidemic of obesity in this country. And it's really important that every diabetic have a yearly eye exam. Um, not only because of the damage that can happen to the retina, but also because we have such a beautiful view of the blood vessels and that your doctors um, want us to do an evaluation because that gives them an, I, them an idea of how the blood vessels throughout the rest of the body are doing. So we always report back to the PCP, the primary care physician, about the, the exam results. All right, so that was the comorbidities. Now we're going to jump into more Parkinson's related. So why is my vision poor and fluctuating throughout the day? Well, there's three main causes of this reduced acuity. Now, before I jump into what those are, I want to define acuity. Acuity, we use that nomenclature of the 2020. What does that mean? Well, a normally sighted person that has no disease in their eye, if they, you stand, stand 20 feet from the chart and you're looking at a certain size letter, the 2020 letter, you should be able to just see that. And the larger that bottom number gets, so instead of 2020, if we say 2200, that means a much larger letter and so worse vision. So what 2200 means is that that normally sighted person can step all the way back to 20 to 200 feet and still see that letter um, because it's larger. So just to give you an idea, 2040 is the legal limit for having no restriction, restrictions on your driver's license. 2070 is um, legally low vision, and 2200 is legally blind. That is with best correction. So don't be confused by that. Plenty of us will go in and we take out our contacts and glasses and see way worse than that, but it's always with the best correction in place. Oh, anyway, I was going to get back to you. So the three main causes are low contrast sensitivity, double vision, and focusing problems. So what is contrast sensitivity? It is seeing something against its, its background. And these, with this chart here, the Snellen chart, this is, you're probably familiar with what is used in most eye doctor's offices, whether it's projected or printed chart. And there is perfect contrast here. I mean, we've got black on white. So this chart doesn't tell us a whole lot about contrast or anything. And it just gets smaller as we go down to like the 2010 and whatnot. Um, in contrast, over there is a chart, which you probably see very little of, but it is, it's called a Pelly robson chart. It's primarily used in research, so you don't see it a whole lot in your eye doctor's office. But you've got this same size letter, and I believe it's about a 2050 letter, and it just gets dimmer and dimmer as it goes down. So my point here is that a Parkinson's patient may be doing just fine on the Snell and Acuity chart, but if they were actually tested on the Pelly robson chart, it may bottom out. Um, but again, just, just don't typically use that chart. Um, so when it comes to contrast sensitivity, I was reading that right after you take your medication, Cinemet or Carbidopa, the contrast can immediately improve. Um, and again, that has to do with those dopamine receptors in the retina. Some of the ways that we can work with this contrast uh, problem is by the use of filters. So a yellow filter, is a good indoor filter for it'll brighten things up but it'll help with contrast it can cause a little bit too much glare when you're outside in the sun um an amber filter is a great lens for driving and uh, helping with the contrast i happen to love wearing an amber sunglass because of the way it really makes reds pop um pink has also been suggested as a great color now something to know about all these filters is it's really going to be very individualized. It has to do with what other kind of diseases are going on at the same time. So a patient should really try out other, the different filters to decide what's going to work best for them or if it will even make a difference. So double vision. Half of the patients with Parkinson's that have come to see me came to me because they were having double vision. Oh, double vision. Double vision. Um, but it means that that's at least what drives them into my office. And so there's different types of double vision. And the first step is to figure out, are we talking about binocular double vision or monocular? And so binoculars are referring to are the eyes not working well together. And the easy way to tell if it's that, if you cover an eye, regardless of which eye it is, and that double vision goes away, we know that it has to do with the two eyes not working together. In contrast, 
If you cover an eye and you're still seeing double vision, it's due to um, one of the several factors. You know, hold on. I know I looked. I had a slide <laughs> that talked about monocular. Anyway, I'll back up and say, um, monocular double vision means that there's something optically weird going on in one of the eyes. And that can be the cornea not being irregular. It could be macular degeneration causing some waviness to the retina. It could be that you're looking through the wrong part of your glasses. You're looking right through the line of the bifocal. Um, and uh, without really an explanation, one of my courses I read said that Parkinson's disease is another cause of monocular it double vision. There. So this slide has to do with binocular double vision, the two eyes not working well together. It's also known as strabismus. And so each eye has six extraocular muscles that tug it in different directions, and the two eyes should always work in tandem, except when you're looking at something at near, and then they converge in together. Um, because these are muscles, and muscles are affected by Parkinson's, just like every other muscle that you have, the coordination is thrown off. And um, I'm going to get back to that in a moment, but I want to talk about convergence and sufficiency. I said that when you look at something up close, your eyes need to track inward. This is also a common problem that come, has to do with um, binocular double vision. Um, sometimes it's difficult for a patient to bring their eyes to converge together, and we can do something about it by putting prism into glasses that will direct the light out to where the eyes are. Um, so typically, convergence and sufficiency, which is something experienced by even young kids, it, that can be dealt with with eye exercises, vision therapy. That's not the case for the Parkinson's patient, however. Really, prism is the way to go. Um, so, and then that prism is something that's only needed in near glasses, not in distance glasses. So this is showing you some of the tools that I use for assessing what type of prism to put in someone's glasses. These are called prism bars as it escalates with the amount of prism and in individual loose lens prisms. And um, I, so I work very hard to try to find the exact amount of prism that we need to make things single, and then we put them in the trial frame. So this is the history, my perhaps shameful history of what's happened as I've worked with Parkinson's patients. And that is someone sitting in my chair, and in, in when we first started get, when I first started seeing a lot of Parkinson's patients, I would work very hard to find that perfect prism amount. They were happy, I was happy, but then they'd get the glasses and it wasn't working anymore. And I've come to figure out that the reason for that is that this eye misalignment is very much dependent on, on the on-offs of the medication, and it varies not just from day to day, but from hour to hour. And so unfortunately, a lot of times trying to solve, particularly distance, um, double vision with PRISM is, is not a long-term, it's not an effective solution. Um, and that leads us to occlusion as being possibly the answer. Occlusion is covering an eye. It can be done with the pirate patch, but that doesn't look too good. So instead, we can use translucent tape, contact paper, or clear nail polish over a lens of the eye um, to obscure the image from that one eye and, and get rid of the double vision. And it doesn't always have to be the whole lens that needs to be occluded. Sometimes just a partial occlusion, so we can still leave more intact the peripheral vision but we're blocking off the part that's causing the doubling. Um, so the third, so we talked about contrast sensitivity, double vision, and the third main factor are focusing problems. And like I alluded to earlier, this lens stops doing its job well in one's mid-40s, and the reason for that is that it's much like an onion. It keeps adding layers throughout our life, and then it's too big, and those muscles just can't act upon it the way it used to. And so that's when we have to rely on some sort of additional correction for up close. So the age group for most Parkinson's patients is beyond age 40, and so they're dealing with this as well. Well, in the normal population, I mean, this is just showing um, how everything's nice in the distance, but mm, up close is getting blurry. So for the normal population, we have lots of different options. Everything from over-the-counter reading glasses, line bifocals or trifocals, Progressive addition lenses, which is another name for no-line bifocal. Computer glasses, bifocal contacts, monovision contacts. So monovision means one eye set for distance, one eye set for near. Or even interocular lenses after cataract surgery. And there are even implant lenses now, so these interocular lenses that give some focusing back. But like I said, not all the are appropriate. When it comes to over-the-counter readers, there was a study that said that there were 
patients who used to feel like over-the-counter readers did the trick for them, once they got Parkinson's, that wasn't the case anymore. Because over-the-counter readers have too much distortion. They don't have an anti-glare coating, and they're not precise for that patient. Um, when it comes to line bifocals or trifocals, every time you hit that line, there's a jump, and there also equates to being um, a loss, uh, an area of lost vision. And so this is going to throw off balance and lead to more falls. So trifocals particularly is the worst option of all of these up here. They should be avoided. So, well, we think we may be solving that by going to progressive edition lenses because there's not going to be a line, but here's the other problem with those. Um, as well as with line bifocals, you've got the distance in the top of the lens and you're near down below. But that near zone is designed for 16 inches for reading, not for the, well, in my case, like four and a half feet down to the floor where I'm looking at curbs and stairs. And so that can lead to falls as well for a patient who's already having balance, um, balance problems. Now, computer glasses, that's a, a pretty easy one. Most of the time they're used when someone's sitting, and so that doesn't cause too many problems, and there's different ways computer glasses can be made. But then that's just for an intermediate distance. Bifocal contacts uh, cause too many contrast problems, even for the normally sighted person. Um, so those would just compound the contrast sensitivity issues. Um, Monovision contacts, as I said, one, one eye for distance, one eye for near, that's going to throw off balance. Interocular lenses, um, well, that's a fine solution for someone after cataract surgery. Uh, the type that gives you back some of your near focus, the accommodating lenses, those sh can't be used either because they're very much like the bifocal contacts. They're going to impair contrast. So which options are the best for the Parkinson's patient? Um, here's just a, a few more considerations that I've had with patients. First of all, with a line bifocal, and some of my patients are very stooped, the issue is trying to get into that reading area. You're going to have to find this really awkward posture of pulling your reading material way in too snug to the body. So that didn't work too well. Um, and then we talked about how multifocals might lead to more falls and should be avoided. Um, so then that you would think, well, okay, I guess we're going to have to do a different pair for distance, a different pair for intermediate, and a different pair for near. And that probably is the best solution. But here's something I really want caregivers to be aware of. Patients don't always know which glasses are for what purpose. And that is a problem that I've seen with patients that have Parkinson's patients that have come into my clinic. They're not aware that the glasses that they're trying to read my distance chart with are, are designed for, for their near vision. And... Um, so my recommendation is if you get different glasses for different distances, make them really different, different design, different color, and maybe even put a tag on them that says what the purpose is for. Um, and then, so I, had, I, I want to go back to a patient I had that was having difficulty remembering which p glasses were for what purpose, and so I tried an option of doing distance only contacts for her. So she'd only have to wear reading glasses over the top of those. Um, it was an interesting challenge that we did for a while. She, of course, had trouble putting in her own contacts and, uh, and then getting in with the way the lids, trying to control the lids was very difficult. So she'd come in monthly and I would insert them for her. Um, one of the challenges is the dry eye, which we discussed. So eventually, that ceased to be a great solution. I think she, she did it for about a year, though. And then the solution was the Center for Cataract Surgery. And with those implant lenses, they were calculated so that they took care of distance vision. And now she only has to wear reading glasses. Um, so that kind of worked for her. So we talked about safety cautions. Again, avoid the trifocals. Be very careful with any sort of line bifocal because of the increased falls and, and on line, line bifocals. Um, so this was proposed, this, uh, this point here, in an article I read. It said that perhaps one of the best options would be, and I know I'm going back to a line bifocal here, but a line bifocal where there was the distance from the top and an intermediate down, be down below. Well, intermediate's not going to help you a whole lot with reading, but it gives you perhaps for seeing your food on your plate, helping with that distance. And I just went to Vision Expo like two weeks ago and came up with a solution there that I'm so excited about. And that is a lens. And actually, I was tuned into this idea by an occupational therapist who was giving a talk. Um, she mentioned this product whereby <laughs> magnets are embedded actually into the lens, so not on the frame. So it can be put in any frame but they're embedded into the lenses over on the edge. And then at the same time that your original lens is created, 
these magnet clips, although the inventor doesn't want the word clip used, I'm not sure what the substitute is. Anyway, they can be put in front of these lenses. Now, picture this. Even though a person may have motor control, if you put that magnet in place, zoomp, it's going to lock in very easily. And so there's a lot we could do with this. When I think about this solution of the distance and then the intermediate, if I put a little bit of power in that clip, I can turn that distance power into an intermediate power. So for using the computer or seeing the food on your plate. And then that'll also turn the intermediate power into now a reading power. The other cool thing, possibility of this, and what she was talking about in her, at um, this occupational therapist in her talk, was putting some prism in for that convergence insufficiency. And so, again, you don't want that prism when it comes to your distance vision, and you may not even need it every day, because remember, with Parkinson's, some of these problems are, var are variable from day to day, but when the prism is needed, being able to clip that on. And then you can also do sunglasses. And I think that's pretty much what the, the manufacturer originally was thinking about, but you, you can make them into sunglasses and try out the different filters for different purposes. So I just found out about that. I had never even heard of that before, but it's something that we're going to start offering at my practice. And I'm excited to see how I might be able to utilize it for many patients as well as my Parkinson's patients. Um, and then the last consideration is that because falls are more likely, use a shatter resistant material um, to, for added protection just in the event that that should happen. Okay, so we just reviewed contrast sensitivity, double vision and focusing problems. There's a host of other problems we're now going to talk about. I, I'm sorry, I'm bouncing around too much and causing this to make noises. I apologize for that. Um, reduced visuospatial attention, eye movement difficulty, abnormal color vision. We talked about dry eye, don't have to revisit that. Visual hallucinations, difficulty opening the eyes, and eye pain and fatigue. What the heck is visual spatial attention? Let me tell you, it took me quite a while to wrap my brain around this. And then I came, found these quotes, and I think these help a lot. So I'm going to read them. Atten I'll read them from here. Attention restricts processing to some items over others and allows the attended item to become more salient or enhanced relative to unattended items. What does that mean? Well, as I see it, We've just got a lot of noise. There's just so much going on in our visual space. And so for our brain to be able to cope with that, it has to ignore certain features and we just focus on what we need to at any one time. So yeah, you know, we see the trees out of our side vision as we're driving along, but it's not really relative until relevant until that kid comes, you know, jumping out on their bicycle kind of thing. Um, so, and then this next quote, attentional processes can be viewed as protecting an organism from information overload. Now, I, I haven't had a conversation with a Parkinson's patient yet about this. I probably should to understand it more. But um, I can see where this feature of being unable to really f drown out the noise and to just concentrate can really make reading difficult. And I know I've had a number of Parkinson's patients who used to like reading and, and they've kind of given it up. And there's a number of reasons. I would think this would be one of them. And then this next point is the other main one. I'm, I'm muscle movement difficulty. So this can be everything from the inability to move one's eyes into up gaze to the inability to fixate and follow, which are called pursuit eye movements. And that means if something's moving, like my finger, I can watch it go around. But the most important when it comes to disabilities with reading are going to be what's called saccadic eye movements. And saccadic eye movement refers to a quick movement from one place to another. And the brain doesn't even process information in between. You just tear to hear. And these are critical eye movements for processing information such as looking at a face and recognizing it. So what these images are showing you is a face and then how a computer tracked someone analyzing that face. And you can see they went back and forth over the eyes and then around. And what that was telling us is that uh, the eye area is what makes us very individualized. And so we tend to look at that most when we're trying to recognize a face. And so there's an organized way that the brain goes about looking at a face. So if saccadic eye movements are impaired, that's going to affect processing and um, recognition and comprehension. Also, saccadic eye movements are key to reading. We don't read word for word or letter for letter. We take in spans of recognition as we go down a line. And then at the end of the line, we need this ability 
to then do a carriage return, like on a typewriter, back to the beginning of the next line without losing our place. Well, if your saccadic eye movements are not working well, and in the Parkinson's patients, they're hypometric, or meaning they move too slowly, what can happen is a patient finds themselves losing their place, backtracking, um, and, and particularly when they get to the end of a line, kind of losing, where do I go from here? Um, and so I think this is a really big contributor for the frustrations that people have with reading. So another factor is abnormal color vision. And these are just showing a couple of tools that are used in, in office to assess color vision. Um, it's been found that red-green differentiation particularly seems to be impaired in the Parkinson's patient. And that the more advanced the disease process is, the worse this gets. So it's kind of like the contrast sensitivity. You have a dulling of colors. Visual hallucinations. Um, some studies, or I think originally it was thought that most of visual hallucinations were the result of the medications that Parkinson's patients are on. But I did come across a study that talked about patients having visual hallucinations who had never been on these meds. So what you're seeing here in this picture is a bunch of monkeys around the stop sign. And that's one of the common types of visual hallucinations, which is seeing animals that aren't there for whatever reason. And another type is to see things as smaller than they should be. They're called Lilliputans, so just like Gulliver's Travels, everything diminished. And a third type of visual hallucination is a sensory perception one. Just perceive that something's there that's not, not really there. Um, Again, so visual hallucinations, again, is one of those things we, we can't do anything about. Um, then there's the difficulty with opening the eyes. Yay. And this comes in two forms. So blood uh, has a Thank you very much, Dawn. You're welcome. Uh, Dawn, I don't want this. The, the <laughs> spasm up and you can't open didn't want to see it. And um, then there's another type called apraxia, where you just can't seem to send that signal to open the eyes. It's not that they're spasm. They just don't want to open. Well, when it comes to the blepharospasm, one of the ways that that can be treated is with Botox. So the same injection um, that takes out wrinkles, and but it's used to relax those facial muscles so the, the eyes can be opened again. I thought it was really interesting that Botox can also be used in Parkinson's patients for things like um, when there's painful dystonia or cramping of the muscle, bruxism or the grinding of the teeth, and also uh, for constipation. Um, so an injection lasts about four to six weeks. Not something that I do in office, or do at all. That's not my scope, but um, that brings us to eye fatigue, or asthenopia is the technical term. Well, we've talked about a lot of different things that would cause the eyes to feel fatigued. And the takeaway message, though, is let's start at least with the basic, which is are you even wearing the right prescription? Um, so let's address any un uncorrected refractive error. So this is my last slide, and I just wanted to talk about how you can get the most out of your eye appointment, and probably any doctor appointment you go to, which is when you make your appointment with receptionist, let them know that you have Parkinson's or that you're bringing some with Parkinson's and that some extra time may be needed. And so then the best slot um, for that purpose will be given. Um, we need to get a thorough health history. We need to know all the medications. It's all required by Medicare. And so if in advance you can fill out that paperwork and bring your list of medications rather than having a good chunk of your appointment time taken up with trying to just get through history, it's already done. Oh, um, and then you'll want to bring, you may want to bring, a friend or a family member or an occupational therapist back to uh, with you to the appointment. Um, the occupational therapist who has sent a lot of patients to me, Holly Gallo here in town. She actually has accompanied quite a few of her patients to the appointment. Um, and so she's able to fill in the, the history story a bit for me. And also she gets to hear some of my recommendations so that that conversation can continue outside of the, the visit. And then do you understand that additional office visits are probably going to be necessary, particularly if we're dealing with things like dry eye or double vision. So that pretty much concludes my talk. Thank you. So um, I guess I'll take questions now, and there's a format for doing that. Thanks, Helen. You're welcome. At the end, you might also tell us where you got your first name from. <laughs> I always thought that'd be kind of interesting.
They use words like heaven can wait and that kind of thing. Um, do, you, do you want me to answer the question? No, no, that's uh, a, yeah. Go no, ahead. honestly, so I get asked that all the time. My father named me, um, and he is maybe a little bit of a prankster, but he's kept it as a lifelong secret, and I'm not kidding you. It is a secret why my, I'm named Heaven. But I have an identical twin sister, and her name is Charmin, also with the I-N ending, so it kind of matches like that. But I'm just glad that I got Heaven versus Charmin. <laughs> yeah, good call, good call. Anyway, ex excellent talk, uh, great information. I hope you guys found it as informative uh, as I did. Um, as always, I ask all the remote sites to please uh, turn on your microphones now, and uh, we'll go through uh, roll call uh, for a Q&A. And as always, just a reminder, uh, let's make sure that you uh, tell us how many people are at each side, okay, so we can get a tally on the numbers for today. So let's start uh, in Anchorage, Alaska. Uh, any uh, questions for Dr. Meyer? Yes, there's one. There's, there are five of us here, by the way. Okay. Thank yes, you. Yes, uh, I have trouble with uh, deaf perception, and my uh, neurologist had to have my eye exam checked out because it, maybe I missed the bottom tier or I can't figure out how how uh, deep it is and falling. Recommend anything for a test for deaf perception? Well, there, there certainly are tests of depth perception, stereo tests where um, you put these polarized lenses on and, and, and look at, well, for example, one I have shows this butterfly that pops out. But you only get good depth perception if you have the two eyes working well together. And that's what's called stereopsis, and it's the pinnacle of vision. So if your eyes aren't working well together, and even if it's just a micro amount of being off, you're not going to have that stereo vision. So uh, it's, it's not surprising that, that that would be a complication. I hope that helps. Are there exercises you can do for your eyes that would help with that? I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Are there exercises you can do for your eyes that would help with that? Exercises. Well, vision therapy is a whole kind of subset field of optometry, and there's definitely plenty of exercises that are out there for um, for dealing with depth perception and, and the eyes working together. But quite honestly, my understanding is that for Parkinson's patients, it's not all that effective. I, I hate to say that, but it seems to be true. And part of it goes back to what I was saying with those, um, the fact that it's not a stable kind of condition. It's progressive, and it varies. So it varies from one time of the day to the next time of the day. So exercises aren't, aren't too effective. So transitional glasses would be not good for that? I'm sorry, for transition glasses? Transitional, uh -huh. Or the progressives? Um, yes. So progressive lenses um, give us all the different distances in, in focus, um, depending on what part of the lens you're looking at. And like I was saying, for, for many people, it's a great option. It's what most of my patients do get. But there comes a time when, when that may not be a good option for the Parkinson's patient because of the uh, the bottom part of the lens being designed for near and it again throwing off one's perception of space and depth when it comes to critical distances and places like looking at your feet um, when it comes to stairs and curbs and the reason one would be looking at their feet even more uh, with one with Parkinson's versus the normal population is again comes down to that proprioception you know um, for most of us, when we can, when we step and, and we're doing steps, we have that automatic knowledge of just how high to lift our foot, and that's lost over time with Parkinson's. And so then you need that that visual stimulus to help you. But if you're looking through the wrong pair, of, wrong part of your glasses, um, or the part that may, would make sense to look through, which is the bottom part of the lens, but it's not set for that. It's set for 16 inches, and so that's that's where the problem arises. Hey, I want to do a shout out to Alaska. I, I grew up in Kenai. Oh, great. <laughs> Thanks. It was a great talk. Thank you. Thank you for your questions. Okay, let's go to uh, Walla Walla, Providence St. Mary's. Any questions? Questions. Thank you. Uh, how many people? How many in attendance? Yeah, looks like two. Okay, 
Uh, Billings, Montana, Deaconess Billings Medical Center or Clinic. Any questions? No, Chris. And how many, we please? Eight. Thank you. We have any questions? Any questions? Any questions? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, Tenasket, uh, North Valley Hospital. No questions, there are four of us. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, Clarkston, Tri-State Memorial. Yes, uh, good afternoon, doctor. Thank you, that was very good. Uh, we have three questions. Uh, the first question is, can you give me suggestions on how to get a correct prescription? Uh, I've been in a situation where when the doctor was uh, flipping the little dials and measuring my prescription, he could not get a convergent answer from me because my eyes kept changing, he said. Um, mm -hmm. Any suggestion on how to get a... A, a good prescription when you have that situation. Okay, one of the things that could make your vision be fluctuating when we're asking which is better, one or two, is excessive watery eyes or the dryness. So if the tears aren't functioning well, that's going to make it really hard to answer. So this may or may not be your problem, but when I find that's the case for patients, I put some artificial tears in right there in the office um, while I'm doing the refraction, and that helps a bit. Um, don't be afraid to just Gently tell your doctor that maybe you need a little bit more time. Um, so sometimes we can get kind of rushed and <laughs> want immediate answers and just a, a reminder that you may need to study a little bit more on that. But I also want to point out that sometimes patients get a little bit worried about what their response is on the which is better one or two. And the fact is when I'm refracting, we're looking for that point where a patient can't tell the difference. That's, that's one of the end points. So to say, I don't see a difference is actually a good response. And it, it, that just means, boom, now we go to the next piece of, this, uh, of the process. Um, hope that helps. That helps some. Uh, two other questions. Uh, is there any effect of 3D television on, uh, on the eyes or somebody with Parkinson's? You know, I don't think there's a lot known about what 3D on the eyes is going to do in general. But, well, I take it back. Let's see. We were talking about vision therapy, and actually 3D tools, like those polarized tools I was using, or using red-green, like is done with 3D TV, are actually methods used for vision therapy. But I think that it's asking way too much of the uh, Parkinson's brain, and by brain I mean the retina and the visual processing, and all of that I discussed, like the visual, spatial, on and on to, to add that extra le level of a 3D vision. I don't think it's going to help. I think it's just going to cause a lot of eye fatigue. Okay, thank you. And the final question had to do with any kind of treatment for dry eyes that you would recommend? Well, there's so many different treatments, and it's really important to, to get with your doctor and have a dry eye evaluation. And in a dry eye evaluation, what I'm looking for is what is the cause of this? So in Parkinson's, sometimes it's really obvious the patient doesn't blink very frequently. But it can be everything from the oil glands that are around the eye not functioning well. And that ties in with that blepharitis. I was describing the inflama inflammation of the lids. And if they're not, if, if the oil glands are gunked up, and what I mean by that is so I'll squeeze on the lids, and it should come out like olive oil, but sometimes it comes out like like toothpaste, then that needs to be addressed, and that's addressed in a very different way than for someone who just isn't producing enough tears. So, for example, there are diseases, autoimmune diseases in particular, like Sjogren's and um, lupus, and, and, and actually just the hormonal changes that happen to women um, post-menopause, perimenopause, and where you don't produce enough tears. And so the type of drop that is chosen is different depending on what the cause of the dryness is. And, and that's really confusing territory because you go to the drugstore and there's shelves and shelves of different eye drops. And so asking your doctor for advice on well, which, which sample should I take, um, we're sampled a lot. We have a lot of samples to give out on that. Um, but really making sure that it's the appropriate one for what's going on with your type of dryness. So it's not an easy answer to just say, the best solution for a dry eye is to use da da, -da. Um, I do find that if there's an oil gland dysfunction and I can get that under control, I like punctal occlusion. I do that a lot on patients 
um, something that that's it's a, it's all build the medical, but it just keeps the tears on the eye longer. But before you can do that, you first have to assess is the the tear makeup correct? Because if there's a lot of gunk and that bacteria is out of control, then by clogging up those punctum, what you're going to do is create the cesspool on the on the lid on, on on the eye in the tears. So you don't want to do that. So anyway, my bottom line is talk to your eye doctor, have a dry eye assessment, and try to get to the bottom of what is your particular needs when it comes to dryness. Thank you very much. Thank you for uh, 12 people here. Sorry. Yeah, I got that. Thank you very much. Uh, how about our friends in OMAC? Any questions? Okay. Uh, let's go to uh, Coeur d'Alene. Uh, Kootenai Medical Center. Yes, uh, we don't have any questions. And uh, how many in attendance? Eight. Sorry. People. How many? Eleven. Thank you. Okay, uh, Ritzville East Adams Rural Hospital. Yes, we're here. Any questions? Can you hear me? I'm trying to get you. Okay. Uh, let's go. Uh, Colfax, Whitman Hospital Medical Center. Not a call. No, oh, they're not here. Okay, never mind. Uh, how about uh, Colville, Providence, uh, Mount Carmel? Hi, we have seven Thank you. in attendance and no questions, but uh, great talk. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Pullman uh, Regional Hospital. There's only one person here, myself. I wanted to thank the doctor for uh, addressing issues that have bothered me, and no one has ever talked to me about things like this before in this way. I understand now a little more about my own problem. Great. I'm glad I was able to help. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, Dayton General Hospital. Any questions, please? Okay. Uh, Port Townsend, Jefferson Healthcare. We have six in attendance and we have no questions. Thank you for joining. Thank you. Uh, Pendleton, Oregon, Public Library. Yes, and there's eight of us here present and we have no questions. Thank you so much. Uh, Grangeville, Syringa General. Hello, we enjoyed the uh, talk from Dr. Heaven, and we have five in attendance here, and uh, yes, we really enjoyed the talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Kennewick General Hospital. Any questions, Kennewick? Can we turn this off, or do you want to listen to Yes, we have a question, Hello, can I wait? Yes, I have a question. Yeah, how many are there? Is there two of you? What's this? Yes, I have a question. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> I'm happy to take your question. Go ahead. Hi, I have a, a cataract, and I go to the second opinion, and the, sick, uh, the second opinion answer the doctor is that my cataract is not ready to take off. And that's my confusing. What's the right, you know, are the doctor are different uh, opinion about the eye cataract? Okay, so the question, if I understand it, is what makes a cataract right for addressing with cataract surgery? Yes. Um, well, there's the rightness involved with your insurance covering the cost of it, and um, that you need to be worse than 2040. And you may remember at the beginning of my talk, I said 2040 is the level at which, um, if you're worse than that, your, your driver's license is going to be restricted. Well, here's the thing you should know about that. You may be 2030, which is better than 2040, but there's what's called a glare test. And I, I don't have one in my office, but when I refer out for a cataract consult, the consulting ophthalmologist does have it. And they shine a light in your eye 
And then while you're being blinded by this light and all this glare is happening from this light being shined in your eye, then they ask you to read the chart. And oftentimes, because of the glare, you go from being 2030 to being like 2060, and voila, you're qualified. So one thing might have been whether one of the doctors didn't have a glare tester or not. But my personal opinion on when is a cataract ready um, is that if you are in good health and up for, for doing the surgery, and like I said, it's not a complicated surgery, it's outpatient surgery, but I, I have a lot of patients that say, oh, I've got all this other medical things going on in my life right now, I, I don't want to have my cataracts addressed right now. Well, do bear in mind that as we age, those medical complications tend to kind of build on themselves. So if your cataract is basically ready and your doctor says you glare test out, uh, then I would go for it because you're going to have a longer time to enjoy the benefits of having this clear implant in place. Now, are there potential bad bad effects of having cataract surgery? Yes, they're fairly rare, and um, and your the ophthalmologist will you know go through those risks with you. Um, so I I hope that helps. <laughs> Thank you very much. And attendance is three. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, Moses Lake, Samaritan Healthcare. Yes, we have seven in attendance. Any questions? Uh, yes, uh, my husband is wondering um, if the vision difficulty cost is it caused from Parkinson's or Carbolevo sediment? Parkinson's, in and of itself, is going to cause a lot of these um, deficiencies that I've talked about because of the retina having those dopamine receptors. So, and everything from even, like I said, the visual hallucinations, that's maybe that the, the drugs make it worse, but they happen in and of themselves with the Parkinson's disease. And I am in no way an expert and can speak to the visual con um, complications that may come with taking these medications. So most of what I was speaking about was just what Parkinson's, the disease itself, does to the visual system. Thank you. Enjoyed your um, delivery. Any more questions? Thank you. All right, thank you so much. Uh, last of our remote sites, uh, Miles City, Montana. Any questions? Miles City? Okay. All right, so let's go to our uh, local audience in Spokane. Folks, any questions? And Walt has a microphone if you... Uh, well, Miles City. Oh. Yes, Miles City, any questions? Yeah, Miles City's here, and we have eight in attendance, but if you will count us for 16, because we all have double vision. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, Anyway, anyway, we, we have a gentleman here that would uh, like to know if there's any way of improving night vision. <sighs> improving night vision. Yeah, that's... Stay at home, right? Well, okay. No, that, that's a really good question. I just want to think about So night vision can be made worse because of cataracts. So one of the things to look at is are there cataracts involved because that's going to cause a lot of, a lot of glare issues. Um, some people are just more prone to night vision problems and with what's called um, higher order aberrations, and this may be going beyond what you want to hear, but it, it, basically there are elements of the visual system that go beyond what a standard what a standard prescription is going to address. And so, for example, I have in my office something called um, a Z-View auto refractor, and it, a wavefront analyzer, and it Sorry. Uh, um, so this Z view will give me a printout that shows not just what the expected refractive correction is with glasses, but also these higher order aberrations. And the bottom line on that, they, it was originally pitched to me that this company could make glasses that were better for night vision. I, I don't really buy into that too much anymore. It's being worked on because wavefront analysis is definitely the wave of optometry as we go forward. But at this point, what I use it for is just to show patients, hey, see this? This is the piece that I can't address. So there may be an element of that. There could be an element of cataracts. There could also just be 
the element of reduced vision and reduced contrast sensitivity. And I, and I probably with Parkinson's would look primarily to the reduced contrast sensitivity issue. Again, the, when at night you're not having the stark black on white or, or anything close to that. So everything is muted and dulled and that's really going to impair the Parkinson's patient even more than um, someone without it because of those contrast sensitivity issues. Sorry, I think I went way off topic on that. Apologize for it. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm sorry. Any other questions? Oh. Okay, let's go to Spokane. Oh, you, you may have spoken to this. When we're asleep, uh, and we're not blinking, I presume, what is it that keeps the eye moist and uh, are we still producing a tear? Yeah. Um, when the eyes are closed, you've got a good barrier going. Now, some people sleep with their eyes um, partially open, and one of the hallmarks of that is when you wake up in the morning, and that's when your dry eye is the worst. Um, particularly another age-related problem is that as our lids start sagging with time and some laxity of the lids, the lower lids can hang open, and so that can happen at night too, causing um, this dryness because you have an exposure over the course of night. But when the eyes are closed well, um, there's not too much, there's, dryness doesn't happen because you've got that mucous me membrane well covered. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, uh, thank you, Dr. Meyer, and thank you to all the remote sites. Uh, we do have a couple items uh, for everybody in the audience today. I'd like to invite up um, Colleen Crowley from Northwest Parkinson's uh, to uh, share a little information with us. Colleen? Thanks, Frank, and thanks, Dr. Meyer. That was really was very interesting information. Well, I'm the director at Northwest Parkinson's Foundation, partner with PRC to present these programs. And um, we're really excited to get to see the Spokane group because when we host these over on the west side, there's um, very few people, relatively speaking, in our room than there is compared to your room. So we always see your big crowd here and we're just really impressed. So. Um, at any rate, um, we're delighted to be here and meet so many people and just wanted to call everyone's attention to the HOPE Conference, which is being held uh, in Seattle on October 29th. I know it's a distance away. Um, we have little brochures here that talk about it and um, certainly want to encourage anyone who's interested in attending to try and make it over. It is an all-day conference and uh, the cost is $30 per person and includes a breakfast and a lunch. and um, I think people get a lot of lot out of the conference every year. So we just wanted to make sure everyone was aware of the conference. That'll be October 29th. It's a Saturday this month. So thanks again. Thank you, Colleen. And and that will be held at the SeaTac Hilton Hotel. So I uh, hope you can make it. That's a wonderful conference uh, that uh, shares great information uh, with everybody. Um, before I have you come up, uh, Walt, uh, for the uh, broad audience, our next telehealth is Monday, November 14th. The speaker will be Becky Tiller. Uh, she is a geriatric case manager, uh, and she comes from Tiller Case Strategies, and she's going to discuss the, the role of case managers uh, in the care of Parkinson's uh, disease patients. So uh, as always, you can get a copy of this and uh, other uh, months programs by DVD um, by calling the PRC or emailing the par PRC. If you have questions about that, do let us know. And uh, Walt, I'd like to call up Walt Jacobowski uh, to talk about Tremble Clefts. The Spokane Tremble Clefts started their uh, seventh year uh, uh, here in Spokane last month. And uh, we're very excited to be able to announce that uh, beginning next month, we will be having a north side branch. Uh, we have a lot of folks on the north side who have been unable to make it to the south side to uh, get to our sessions. And uh, the first session will be uh, held on November 2nd at the uh, 
Avalon Care Center um, from 2.15 to 3.15 p.m. And it will be held uh, there uh, the first Wednesday of every month. Initially, we'll start off with just the one session uh, every month, and we'll see how that works out. Anybody from the north side is welcome to attend the south side session and uh, vice versa. Uh, if you need any additional information on this, just uh, give the PRC a call. And if there's anybody out there at any of the uh, uh, remote sites who would like to have some information on uh, starting your own group, just give us a call. Thank you. Thanks, Walt. Um, one last thing, too, is uh, this past Friday we had our annual, annual fundraising event called Shaken But Not Stirred. And if anybody here in the Spokane or surrounding areas attended that, uh, thank you for coming. Uh, it was a wonderful time, I think, enjoyed by everybody. And we'll look forward to having you again next year. Uh, Dr. Heaven Meyer, thank you again for your time today. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing everybody next month. And please uh, travel safely. Take care.